thing about Toto is, I mean, nobody sounds like Toto. I mean, it's like, I mean, there are people that would dig that. Not sounding like. <laughs> <laughs> When Steve Lukather picked up a guitar for the very first time, no one, not his parents, not his friends, not even Steve, knew what trajectory he was on. I mean, no one is born successful. Success just doesn't fall in your lap. It's like a math equation. Zero equals zero. If you do nothing, you get nothing. Now, Steve, he made it happen. And he has kicked ass his entire life. It wasn't luck, and it wasn't just his amazing talent. He took what talent he had, and he worked his ass off and still working his ass off. Listen, if you become great, a great musician from lots and lots of practice where people want you to play in their band and the band becomes successful, you score the touchdown. If you make a career as a session musician, I mean, that's really hard. You score the touchdown. If you are successful at both, you won the Super Bowl. If you write songs and have a solo career, making records and tour the world, you score the touchdown. If you are a cool person, someone who is easy to get along with, a team player, someone who is creative and innovative, and you're that person everybody wants next to them, you scored a touchdown. Steve is all of those things and more. You want this guy on your team, that's for sure. He motivates any room, whether it's on a stage or in a recording studio. Now, Steve is a five-time Grammy winner, eight times nominated, and one of the greatest session guitar players ever in the history of rock and roll. I know, I mean, I played with this guy. And he's a funny guy, too. He's been active in the music biz for five decades and still going strong. He's on multiple Billboard top 10 hits. He has a solo career and released eight solo albums. Nine Steve, next week. Oh, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> he, has, he has a solo career and has released nine solo records. Nine solo albums. Like, God, you made me laugh. He has a solo career and has released nine solo albums. Steve's a singer, songwriter, co-founder of the band Toto, and has toured with them since the inception. He also tours with Ringo Starr and, has, and is a solo artist. In 1982, Steve won a Grammy Award for his work on the George Benson single entitled Turn Your Love Around, and it was deemed the best R&B song of 1982, uh, and his co-writers for this award included Jay Graydon and Bill Champlin. Steve also helped write hit songs for Toto, Michael Jackson, Boss Gags, and The Tubes, to name a few. He also wrote an amazing autobiography that, go, that got five stars and was number one on Amazon. Gospel According to Luke. Love that title. In 2015, Guitar Player Magazine honored Steve with a Lifetime Achievement Award. That means you're old. Okay, now, before I introduce him, this, you got go, you got to go bear with me on this. This is the short list of records play, Steve has played on. This is the short list of records Steve has played on. Some of them I have. Herb Alpert, America, George Benson, Michael Bolton, Larry Carlton, Bill Champlin, Cher, Cher, Chicago, Joe Cocker, Alice Cooper, Peter Chris. By the way, a lot of these artists, he's done multiple right. records with them, which means they like him as a player and a person. Neil Diamond, Earth, Wind & Fire, Aretha Franklin, Michael Jackson, Elton John, Quincy Jones, Ricky Lee Jones, Kenny Loggins, Melissa Manchester, The Manhattan Transfer, Richard Marks, Michael McDonald, Joni Mitchell, Livin' Newton-John, Randy Newman, Lionel Richie, Lee Ridnour, Get the Drift, Kenny, Ro uh, Kenny Rogers, Diana Ross, Leo Sayre, Boss Gags, Ringo Starr, Barbara Streisand, Donna Summer, The Tubes, Joseph Williams, Wilson Phillips, John Anderson, Paul Anka, Chet Atkins, Patty Austin, The Brothers Johnson, Jackson Brown, Belinda Carl. I did that record with him. Eric Carmen, Kim Carnes, Peter Starr, Desmond Child, <laughs> Eric Clapton, David Crosby, Crosby, <laughs> Christopher Cross, the Crusaders. You see that all these different styles too. Sheena Instant, Sheena Easton, Don Felder from the, the Eagles, David Foster, Peter Frampton, Art Garfunkel, Hall and Oates, Herbie Hancock, Don Henley, the Jacksons, Al Jarreau, Jermaine Jackson, Shaka Khan, Greg Lake. John Mayo, Meatloaf, Ronnie Millsap, <laughs> Graham Nash, Stevie Nicks, Ozzy Osbourne, Billy Preston, Timothy B. Schmidt, another Eagles, Bob Seger, we both played on that record together, yeah. Spinal Tap, Rod Stewart, Bernie Toppin, Dion Warwick, Roger Waters, Leslie West, uh, Gary Wright, Sarita Wright, finally, Warren Zevon, that's the tip of the iceberg, 
dude, did I leave anything out? <laughs> Dude, I mean, come on. What are you doing? Come on, it's 10. What are you doing? No alcohol in this beer. I'm going to need a non alcoholic beer yeah. after that one. Yeah. Dude, I mean, I mean, that was ridiculous. I know. Well, you know, Lee Sclair had one, but yours blows his away almost. No, no, Lee's been a lot more record than me. Mm. I met Lee when I was 19, just first starting out. We've been brothers ever since. I love him to death. Now, granted, I mean, you know, we, we, we started, I'm not, I haven't recorded as many as you have, but we started at the right time, you know, when business was amazing. But like, I mean, people aren't just hiring you because you're a good player. Is it? It's more than they're playing. They, they like you. I mean, you you know, they want you around, man. You're funny. You're yeah. cool. I can be sometimes. <laughs> Depends on who you ask. You know, humor is very subjective. Well, we, I know some of the people we shouldn't ask, but yeah, yeah but that's, that's incredible. Yeah, well, you're the same way as I am. I mean, you described yourself. <laughs> I just what? You described yourself. I mean, you, everything I've done, you've done as much crazy. I know, stuff but about. but you're like you're at another level. I didn't grow up in L.A. I mean, you you went to high school with the Picaro brothers, David Page. It was like that pool of incredible talent. At yeah, that man, I grew up in a really great neighborhood. A bunch of guys that wanted to do this since we were like twelve years old. You know, Michael yeah. Landau, John Pierce, myself. It was all the same hood. I know. Before. Before we moved on to high school, where we met the Picaro brothers, which obviously changed our lives yeah. incredibly, you know. And that's when we really started studying actual music, you know. Yeah. I'm nuts and by crammed like 10 years of studying in three years. I was obsessed. Yeah. You know, I had to do it all and I had to learn it really fast, you know. Because opportunity knocks, you got to be ready. I mean, but the thing is, what's incredible that, you know, and I always, you know, we're just doing whatever, you know, whatever. It's fun. So, play music live studio whatever oh, yeah sure but then next thing you know you, you know you played on so many styles it's not just one style you know and then i mean nine records is a solo career that's just in itself somebody would say wow man i got a solo career and we know a lot of people like that but you had this insane studio career and then toto which is you know the thing about toto is i mean nobody sounds like toto i mean it's like i mean there are people that would Dig that. Not sounding like them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, but nah, I mean, man, you know, you we know, didn't talk about it. It's like, you, you know what it's like. You get a group of guys yeah. who play the way they play, and then you stick them in a room together, and it creates yeah. a sound. You know that for doing sessions every day. Every time you get in a room with different guys, yeah. uh, a different sound happens, because yeah. it's just, that's what it is. So we got together and play together without saying nothing. That's what it the way it comes out is the way it came out. We didn't talk yeah. about it. And we worked quickly, too. We didn't even, we we got to take so fast that, like, we didn't have time to talk about it. So right. I, we'd be overdubbing within the first. Well, know. I mean, you guys were, you know, you were professional. The studio was like go, like going to your living room, you know? So it wasn't like. Greatest times of my life, man. That whole area, how, like, wait, staying how, young and coming up yeah. with all the excitement of it all starting to happen, and then the band happened at the same time. It was, yeah. The odds of that are pretty small. Well, who decided to even start a band? I mean, you guys were all doing sessions together. Well, well, listen, when you're young, you know, you're, you know, you start playing, you want to be in a band. Yeah. You have yeah. record, hit record, yeah. you go on the road, and the dream, the cliche dream. Yeah. The studio thing kind of happened not bad, but we didn't even know what that was until we really got into high school. We met everybody. Yeah. We were like, wow. That's really cool. I want to do that. Total come before the studio? No. Nothing not so. We I didn't know. So. We were learning about the studio thing while we were in high school and studying yeah. with the hopes of maybe getting a shot to do that. But we were so bullheaded and so blinders on. We were like, there's no way it wasn't going to happen. Right, 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 right. It wasn't cocky. It was more like, well, if we don't do this, we, have, we don't know how to do anything else. Oh, dude, I thought the and same thing. It'll be working at, you know, in and out Burger, you know, making cheeseburgers for people. And I wouldn't be very good at that either. <laughs> you know, the thing is, I look back and think, God, I was naive to think I was going to make it. But well, what else were you going to do? Plus, you saw people making it. It was the beginning of rock and roll. You could actually get, you practice, you get with the best players, you get a record deal, you write songs, you put a record out, you go on tour. I mean, it was happening. So yeah, you it thought it doesn't happen like that anymore. I mean, you know, without being weird, I mean, I think we we had the last era of the yeah. session guy in the true sense of the word. Yeah. People share files; they do all this different way to do it now. You were, but we show up going, "Who's on the session?" Something. Who's the artist? 
Yeah. What kind of music are we playing today? You walk in, it's like, yeah. You see the trunks in the hallway. You go, oh, yeah. so, oh so-and-so's here. So, oh, it's going to be great. And we see each other. It's, it was a club, you know, and you were in it. And it was really cool. Well, we wanted to be like, you know, the guys that came before us, the wrecking yeah. crew guys. Yeah. And then, of course, the, you know, the, the section guys, you know. Yeah. It was an immediate family. Which the immediate family, know, yeah. At least all that group of guys that I got to play with and low in love for 45 plus years, you know. Still friends. All of us are still friends. I know. You know, we see each other not as much as we used to, but when we do, we're instantly yeah. in that group of cats. You well, know, that have the stories. And I remember the time and all that. Yeah. Everybody has different stories. Well, I've said this when I was up at your house. It's like, I feel like, you know, we went to Vietnam mm -hmm. together or something. We had an experience. I don't think we should compare it to that. <laughs> but we, we experienced something that is so unique and different. And you had to be there. It's hard yeah. to explain. You know, it's really hard to, you know, the creative process. Like, well, how do you guys do that? What, were you, did, what did you say to each other? It's like, they put a chart in front of us most of the time. It didn't have much on it. Uh, especially, you know, I mean, it was just chords and, and yeah. rhythmic notation and a roadmap of how the song goes. But most of it was like fill in the blanks. You know, what are you going to play? And you had to go. How many times do you have a B minor, A, G? You know, it's like, yeah. okay, these are the same chords. What are you going to play over that? And you have, to, uh, you have to have an arranger's ear. Yeah. In other words, there's the melody, there's the song, and then what goes on around that. Yeah. And that's what was needed to be filled in. That's why we got hired, because we come up with cool parts that were hooky. And, and we did it with quickly and efficiently and fun, and we laughed yeah. and had a great time. And we <laughs> tried to do the best we could for every artist we ever worked with. Yeah. And even if we weren't like loving the song per se, go like, oh, like, oh no, oh, not this one. But, <laughs> yeah. but we, Big smile. Like, yeah. Come on, man. You want me to do it again? Okay, I'll do it again for you. Because that was the job. Yeah. It's not to me. Yeah. What I think is good or not. I mean, who cares? You know, yeah. I was expected to give my very best to everything. And I did, no matter what. I tried to come up with a cool party, even though know, yeah. it's a dumb song or something. Yeah. Why not? Yeah, why not? I mean, otherwise, you, I mean, that's part of the you enjoying want, you what you do. You want the artist to feel special. Like you're giving yeah. them some. They're hiring you. It's like, you know, why am I paying all this money for these guys? Yeah. Like, and all of a sudden you see them get really excited when their acoustic guitar song or their piano song. And all of a sudden yeah. all the guys put all their parts yeah. and their little things magically happen. The groove happens. Yeah. And you see the artist is almost in tears or so because it, they didn't imagine it was going to be that good. Yeah. And we give that to them. And that was a great feeling of yeah. giving. Yeah. It was beyond money and all that stuff. We, uh, I mean, yeah, we made a good living and all that, yeah. but it was a great time. Yeah. And it was so exciting to, to be diverse music and different people. Got to work with the best engineers, the best studios, the best producers, uh, best musicians. And even all of a sudden you're in a room with your heroes, the people that you always wanted to play with. And yeah. all of a sudden they're there. Yeah. You know? It's like, oh, this is really great. And then all the goofy stuff we got up to uh, after hours. Yeah. That was all. Oh, yeah. A lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, the cool thing is, with what we're doing, you could be you could be like a B.B. King on Monday, Elton John on Tuesday. Uh, yeah. Stevie Wonder on Thursday. I mean, you know what I mean? It's like in one week, it would be like somebody's lifetime of, oh, I would love to have done that week well, for my whole it was, life. It was, a, it was amazing because sometimes you found yourself in the middle of it and you didn't really realize, especially in the multiple studios. And yeah, yeah. Well, when you go to Sunset Sound, there's three rooms yeah. and you're walking down... You're in the bathroom taking a leak, and somebody goes, "Hey, mate, can you come in and do a solo thing real quick?" <laughs> like, yeah, I can do that. I roll an amp in, fucking play. Well, something else is happening. You know, yep. now, drummers can't do that, so it's a lot harder. But I mean, I got a, a still lot meet of people. I, I do like you know, a bunch of sessions in one day, three yeah. different records in one day. Yeah, and then I'm yeah. Thinking about it, and I used to joke That's... about like if I just leave signed W floors around, but somebody will put it in there. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah, he's probably on this session. <laughs> get paid anyway. <laughs> Those were great. Those are the, that was a hundred years ago, though. I mean, this doesn't exist anymore. So I was reading something, and I I didn't know this. You know, you you're like you know you you got a deep side to you. You know, you really you see things. You're intelligent, obviously, but you see things from a heartfelt place. You're a heartfelt guy, and so I was reading something about your book, and you got to tell me about your grandma. Is it Maya or Mia? Mia. Tell. I didn't even know you had a grandma, but well, everybody had a grandma, man. You know, yeah, at but, some point. Yeah, I guess we never got into that discussion. No, I had, um, I had so wonderful we... grandparents. Yeah, on both sides, but they the... were very different. For example, my mom, my mom's mom was Mia. She was very spiritual, and she right, taught that's... me about 
you know, uh, manifestation, imagining what you already have. She was, that's deep, she, she was very, she was Christian, but she wasn't, she didn't believe in uh, organized religion. Stuff yeah. Where there's money involved, she gets really, she, we get really uptight about people making money off God and stuff like that. So, I mean, that was instilled in me. Well, he doesn't know how to balance his checkbook, obviously. No, he does, but uh, in offensive <laughs> size the point. Cash, no, but she gave me so many tools, and, yeah. and it, was, it was the nurturing mom that I saw, grandma I saw all the time, because she was always at my parents' house. She was always oh, cool. Home. Now, my dad's mom spoiled me rotten. Yeah. Bought me my first Beetle boots. Took me to see Hard Day's Night 20 times, and my parents were like, stop. You know, <laughs> you know she, she'd do things, and she was just wonderful. She made great food, and she was a big, you know, a big presence. That's, geez, so I'm mean, these two. Two great, two different things, but both really had a lot to do with my young nurturing how as a human who being. You are. Yeah, yeah. Because there's my great parents who were really supportive of what I wanted. Yeah, to do. I thought I was a little crazy. My old man I thought I was pretty nuts. Man, the really? thing that saved me because he's like, "What's you know, okay? You want to be a musician? That's great. What are the odds what of actually making yeah. a living doing this?" I, I'm like, well, there's other, you know, I'm, it's not about just being a rock star, Dad. I mean, I realize that's that's a needle in a haystack. I understand. Like, you can make a living. Back then, there was a lot oh, of, totally. you could make a living as a musician. So this great guy moved in next door to my parents' house. He was a drummer in Helen Reddy's band. Now, here's a guy who owned a house, had a wife, working, but he wasn't famous. So, all of a sudden, being a musician, you could own a house, being a musician. Uh. So, I got, you know, I got to talk to his name is Mike Berkowitz, a sweet man who I haven't seen in a thousand years, but you know, he, he you know, he made it a little bit more uh, realistic. My old man yeah. saying, well, if you study, you can have a job as a musician without worrying about this famous crap. Yeah. You know what I mean, does he want to be okay? Fine. If that's what you love to do, how are you going to afford a family and a life? Yeah. Sitting in their house you know, back then, which there wasn't that many of us back then. Yeah. Now every other oh, house has somebody banging on drums or a guitar or yeah. a keyboard, you know, doing something or another. Back then, it was, it was a lot less of us. Yeah. So, I mean, and there was no classic rock because everything was still happening in real time. I yeah. saw the Beatles change my life. Boom. Yeah. I never looked back. That yeah. was it. Yeah. I'm done. Yeah. Same I'm with me. doing that. Yeah. I was like, really, man? Do you think so you can kind of compare yourself to something. And then he added all these years later, and I've worked with these. Well, how about you? Ringo's and I did friend. that Beatles tribute. Remember that? With the I go to your house. Cause you, I go to your house. We drive, and then we are honoring the Beatles for the the hard days, and not the hard no, days, the, uh, Ed, the Ed, Ed Sullivan show that we that changed our lives. And now that messed me up, man. When we right took, before we went on, I mean, the week of rehearsals we did with yeah, everybody, which there. was some interesting choices on who did what songs, yeah. knowing that we're going to play in front of Paul and Ringo. But yeah. you know, Don was was great. He's such yeah. a great guy. And that was such an honor to be a part of that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because, come on, that did change our lives. And I got a little, right before we went on to do the show, yeah. the night of the taping, and then the audience was there, and Paul Ringo was there, yeah. and they had been there all week, which was great. I looked up, and I saw this hard day's night of the black and white, and I just kind of looked looked over at them. I looked at myself holding a guitar, go, really pulled this off. Like, yeah. my little little kid sitting in front of the black and white TV set watching 50 it. 50 years it. later. And all of a sudden you're there. And yeah. And you're, you've been invited to celebrate that moment. It's rather surreal. I had the same feeling. It was a very, you know, it didn't get lost in me. I didn't take, you're in the room with greatness, legends. Yeah. And, and you see the process and they all work different. Everybody works different. They have a different way of the process. Yeah. And you're sitting in the room being a part of that. With some of the greatest names that there are. And you, just, you had to pitch yourself to <laughs> That's one of the most. I mean, you gotta be cool and bring it. You yeah. know, obviously, there you're there to do your job. But at the same time, when you take a deep breath and in your that moment in your brain when you look around the room, going, I can't believe I'm sitting in this room with all these really cool people. I had to try not to think that because it was like we had a job to do. You know, sure. we're going from song to song. Oh yeah, we have time and, to and think, you, dude. And suddenly, suddenly you're doing something with Joe Walsh, and all of a sudden you're doing Bulldog with Dave Grohl. And it's like one of the coolest things about that thing was I remember. They split our band way apart. Lenny Castle was about 
eight football they fields. They were going to, they, they didn't want to show us on the TV. You know, they wanted that big backdrop. That was where the visual was more important than the audio. And wait a minute. I think it was Ringo. The fucking Ringo was the one that said, hey, I play in a band. No, he made us know he was going to do a tune and they put his drum set by himself. Yes. The of the thing, and we were all over. He's like, I'm not doing that. Exactly. He made and Ken Ehrlich the- move. Every, everything and it was like that was the coolest thing ever that was the coolest ring was a band guy man yeah i mean he loves to play with the <laughs> guy i mean i do it with i'm lucky to say i do it with him all the time. i did it last night in san francisco i love it it's the greatest king it's like this is a job that's an honor <laughs> and he treats us so great he's become a great friend of mine i know cherish blows me away he calls you up and you go over to his house like he's just the hey can I, oh, yeah. hey i'm gonna come up he says no i'm going over to ringo's house i Going to house. Well, I mean, you know, I know when you say it out loud, it's it's, it's kind of weird, but you know, I mean, really cool. But you know, I don't. It's mean it like that. I mean, you, hey, he lives eight minutes from me. You know, come on over there, or whatever. We, he likes me, and I love him. You know, do anything, I do away. anything for him. You know? After that show, I went into the audience, you know, and there was those elites. These are like uh, Tom Mays and his wife, and Ringo and his wife, and Paul McCartney and his girlfriend, and. Uh, the, you know, the widows of John Lennon and George Harrison, and I think Johnny Depp was there, and Sean Penn and Tom Cruise. And Ringo's applauding me, and I'm like, and it was at that moment I'd met him, but I never had a chance to talk to him really. And all of a sudden, I went, it hit me. I went, you know, I said, dude, I got on one knee. That's what I got on one knee because everyone was looking at me, and he says, oh, it's okay, I'm already married. <laughs> That's what he's funny. Right? So I said, no, dude, you're the reason why I play drums, man. You're the reason why I play rock and roll. And you and the Beatles, you guys set me on a course at age 10 that I've been on for my entire I just want to thank you. And that that was it. So Yeah, I got to say that to George and Paul. You know, yeah. that is, they did it all for us. Yeah. So we've been able to work with three of the four of them, you know. It was one of my great moments of life. Really. It's like, and you get to still play with him. I do, man. It's amazing. I, mean, I told like, him he had to kill me to get rid of it. <laughs> Dude, that's just like, yeah. I no, mean, man, we have a great relationship. It's, it's a great band, great group of guys. Oh, yeah. Everybody that's ever been in I love everybody in that since band. Since I joined, you know? Yeah. The, all the amazing musicians that were in and out of the band. I don't know why he kept me, but. Like, I know why. It's like, it's explained why. He <laughs> likes to have you around. You're funny. Yeah, I mean, I'm you're a, fun. I, I you play good. I amuse him well, <laughs> more than, more that than anything. Exactly. Oh, yeah. You amused me. I remember we did a session. I don't know who it was, and I get on a plane to fly back to, to Indiana, and all of a sudden there's a raw chicken leg. No, no, I, no. I bought a bunch of raw chicken wings and put it in. It was because very, I knew you were getting on a plane. Yeah. Now this is pre nine eleven and all that yeah. dirty shit. So you get away with I'm it. I'm like going in my bag. I feel something wet and cold. It's a chicken wing. And a big raw. One. Raw. Uncooked. Yeah. And I'm like, I think I was on the plane when you could put a credit card in and call. I knew it was you. Yeah, of course. As soon as I saw it, like, Dad, to, look at and this. And you did call me. I called you from the phone like eight No, nine. I had the runners going out and getting <laughs> <laughs> I used to be with the you. So, I remember once coming into Cherokee Studio. That was good. You know, it's God bless him. Oh, Cherokee, yeah. Cherokee. And I was there so much that, like, they knew I was coming. And they bought a blow-up doll, and they put yeah. it hanging from the ceiling with a, with a sign on it that said, Welcome, Luke, right? I was going to start a record with somebody, one of the Rob brothers, bless me. The Rob brothers, you know, yeah. And they put it up there, and I walk in. I crack up, and then I rip it off the ceiling. I open up the door to the main room. Now, you know, Studio One was yeah. right at the end. I kick the thing as hard as I fucking can. The door opens, and it hits George Martin in the face. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it, was, it didn't hurt him. It, yeah. it was like a you know, yeah. balloon, but it was a blow up to the chick with the open mouth. I know the whole thing, and it goes right into the, That was my introduction to George Martin. Right? Did you have to work with him that day? Not that day, but I mean, I was like, oh my God, Mr. Martin, I don't know what to say. I'm like the biggest fan. He was like, oh, it's fine. He's like, he didn't hurt. Yeah. I thought it was ridiculous. And then I ended up working with him, and I go, do you remember that that day in Paul Louis? I go, that was me. <laughs> that was you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we want you around. I mean, you know, it wasn't that. It was just such a. In the late 70s, early 80s. Oh, and it's Cherokee. Those were wild. I spent some time there. Those were crazy days. That was crazy. Right there in Fairfax. 
that's I what, a lot of records there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. And did you ever do the cars? They would, they were, well, they, they don't do, do, they don't need me. Elliot East is the one with Greg. Oh, yeah, right. well, uh, of course. They, no, they, but no, but we worked with their engineer, Jeff Workman, who was oh, Roy Baker's yeah. engineer. Yeah. He did our third record with us. And, you know, we need to work with people all the time. I want to work with that guy. So that's yeah, how you make those relationships. Yeah. What was the first session you did? I mean, and how old were you? I did a record for a guy named Phil O'Kelsey, who is no longer with us, but uh, I was 18. And, and we were at, uh, first time I was on my union yeah. check, like a real session. Yeah. Uh, and it was at, uh, what was the room where they cut Pet Sounds in? Oh, Western Studio 3, which is now East West. East West, know? yeah. In but, the back. It, but in the back. You know, it was Western 3, where they yeah. cut, you know, the wrecking crew spent half their life yeah, in yeah. that very room, you know. Yeah. So that was one of my, you know, that was really cool. Oh, that was your first one? Yeah. The first, I mean, I used to do a lot of demo sessions yeah. and stuff like that, but the first union was yeah. going to be a record. Now, the record didn't do anything. I mean, right. But, you know, I hear I was 18 years old, and in, in another room, I saw like Jay Graydon's trunks, and went, oh, wow, man. Like, I'm like, those are the guys that like I want to be like. Those yeah. Guys. I just, well, you was eighteen that? years old, seventy six. So <laughs> you didn't have the big refrigerator. Dude, the, there wasn't didn't exist. The Bradshaw. So you, no man, just I had, like an amp. Right? No, I had an amp and, and a cable. You know, and I had a couple of MXR pedals, yeah. but they were brand new. You know, all those MXR. So what were you playing? Like, a, was that like a Fender amp and a Strat? What was your? No, it wasn't. No, I had an Ampeg VT twenty two, like Keith Richards, and I had my. Oh. Uh, 71 Les Paul Deluxe, oh, yeah. small pickups in it, which is great. My, my old man got that when I was a kid. Instead of getting himself a car, he got himself, he got me. A, wow, he uh, knew to get you a Les Paul? Yeah, I mean, I, he, he's, it was, it was a very beautiful moment, my father. Wow. Yeah, that's, took, wow. Changed so, like, I mean, but, changed my life. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. Your guitar sound has changed so much. So. Well, it always changes, man. Yeah. I mean, when you first started, making records what did your drum sound like I whatever they what were they i don't know i had one drum set barely had enough money for heads well they, I mean, you know you make do with what you got and yeah. then as you get better at it and and the technology got better yeah and your experience of how to get this, the right sound oh, yeah. can be captured when yeah. you first go in there you have to learn how to how do i get the sound in the studio and how do headphones and all this stuff that's been doing all those demo sessions back in the day before they had computers to make demos they'd hire like minor leagues it's like okay i'm playing you know get 25 bucks a tune to yeah play on somebody's songwriter demo to get a record deal or whatever you or they hire you to do a showcase for them you know you do those kind of gigs right out of high school but check this out it's like dude there's a point where like for, i know where my point was you know you're just doing whatever you know and all of a sudden you're now defined as that sound you uh, it, from a record like you know whatever record you're on it's like oh, i want that luke sound from what that record. So now that's you. Oh, you, you know, know what I mean? Back then, we used to do a lot of layering. Like, we'd double track stuff and make yeah. it a little out of tune to get that of chorus course. Beely kind of thing. You know, but then they wanted it. that. Well, yeah, you just try to give them whatever they wanted, you know? Of course. But, before, but the, the racks and all the craziness and all the Bradshaw stuff didn't come in until, like, early 80s. Yeah. Oh, well, I remember. The first one I saw was Michael Lando had it. Yeah. And oh, was he was like, wow, first. that was fantastic. Oh, actually, it was Buzzy Feet. Take it back. Oh. Then Mike had, I said, man, that sounds incredible. I got to get some of that. Dude, you and guys. And then it became would... a thing. And, you know. I remember it'd be like refrigerators were being rolled in, oh, you know, yeah. like. It was a great time for cartridge companies. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. The cartridge companies moving the gear over, making as much as the musician. <laughs> yeah. about say. Jay Gray, didn't he have like two of them? Like, it'd be like. No, no, Jay was always had. He, at that point, Jay had gotten out. Jay was the first guy I ever saw use two amplifiers with the Roland Boss chorus and gave it oh, that yeah. beautiful stereo. Oh, yeah. That was a 1977 thing, you know? Yeah. And uh, that was a big deal. You get two, like, deluxes or two uh, Princetons and you put that thing in there. Then you ask the engineer for two tracks. And I have two tracks in stereo. Wow. And that was when it was wow. just 24-track tape. They were like, hey, man, I don't know about that, man. We need that for vocal. I go, but just check it out and listen to it. Oh, wow. wow. It was the hard sell. Because it would make playing just chords, it would give it the shimmer and yeah. all this stuff. And it was a new thing. It was a new yeah. sound. So every time new stuff came along, uh, the session guys would pretty much, we'd get our hands on it first and be able yeah. to use it on stuff. Yeah. And once he got on a record, sometimes they go, how did you get that sound on that record? I want that. Yeah. 
But then they'd ask you for at a time where you're going, this song, it's not going to work in this. I know. You, know, you think you want that. Don't you hate that when they go like, you want that sound? Like, really? That doesn't even make sense. Or you get, I get the thing like, hey, man, just do whatever you want. But they know exactly what they want. They want that, but they say do whatever you want. And I'm like, I'm trying to figure out what they think whatever you want well, is. Well, that just means they don't know. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I don't need this. I don't know what I want, but I want it. I want <laughs> Like, do you want me to play I've everything? Worked with a few I've ever of those people. Well, back in the day, it used to be when they had limited tracks, right? Yeah. Like, you know, if you did a solo, say. Yeah. And, and no pro tools. So. Oh, no, no, no. I mean, it was like you have one track. Yeah. So if you played something and you go, I, that's pretty, I, that's, and I play my best stuff right away. Yeah. Before I start overthinking. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Unless it was a specific written or, or yeah. melodic part that it was the yeah. most arrangement. But as far as blowing a solo or playing fills and stuff, you go have one track. Yeah. That was it. <laughs> so if they go, like, you play something, you go, that's pretty good. I think that's about nothing. That's pretty good. They go, nah, I think you got another one. I go, well, yeah, but you're going to erase that and it's not coming back. And I go, okay, I'll do it for you, but I'm just going to go on record saying, that's I think that's it. Man. And then, and then that puts pressure on me. Yeah. I've got to go, they want something different, but they, as good as that. that. But that was, yeah. And you know, that worked. But they're hiring me. And, yeah. all, you know, many times it would be like the best stuff would get erased. I mean, I get the that it was good, but oh. the initial, like, freshness. Yeah. And well, that's what, you, like you said, that's what you're king at. You some know, people didn't believe you could get stuff done in one or two takes. They I know. They make it painful for two or three days. I'm not going to mention names, I'm but I know some producers are like, beat it to death. Oh. It's like, they likely. wouldn't know if you had a take. They would. They don't even know when you got a take. They don't know. You just, they just want Jeff you to do it. Carl was great at that because he could convince, like, his body, like, he'd get in there, he'd look at us, he'd go, like, you want to get out of here? <laughs> <laughs> and he'd go out Give there me a story. and start pointing at the speakers, going, like, getting everybody vibed. And that's the take. Let these guys fix their part. That drum part, that's the take. We the land most of the time. And it was. And the, I mean, yeah. He was the you know, original, like, first or second take guy. Yeah. And like we were just learning the tunes, they're just trying to figure yeah. out the arrangement. But his drum part was so great. Like, well, well, we'll figure it out to the take. Yeah. But the same with you guys. Yeah. Your part's great, but everybody else messed up. So I remember several minutes today, there's a guy I worked with who wanted to do eight billion takes because the OCD and he wanted to, it just, and uh, the, it, I heard the story that, that JR had worked with this guy on a record. And um, JR said, Oh, I'll let you take. And the guy said, no, I said, JR said, that's your take. And it got, you know, JR's big. And he's like, oh, and I don't true. know who won. I think JR finally just walked out, but he was kind of like, you know, but he, I did a lot of records with Quincy with uh, JR. Like the early days, the dude record and then yeah. the Michael Jackson thriller stuff. Did some of that and some of the other records that Quincy was doing at the time. Patty Austin, James Ingram, Herbie Hancock. We were with, uh, you know, this was a great time. This was a great session. Yeah, I never got to work with Quincy in the studio. I did a a thing outside. With what was that like? I mean, what was his way? What was his deal like? He's prof you know he, he's, he's a guy. guy he, right? he was a great casting director. He would hire yeah. the right guys and put them in a room. He thought he also had the great ear for songs. Yeah, it, most of the time he just let us do what we wanted to do. Rod Temperton, when we worked with Rod, Rod who didn't read or write music. But was very specific with everybody. He'd come up and sing everybody their parts. Wow. And they were not like... Were they good they, they parts? Were, oh, no, they were... Not only were they great parts, but you think, oh, it's a pattern, but there'd be one oh. phrase that was in the, mm -hmm. in the pattern you had to memorize. It was like, good thing I was young, right? Now, like, uh, 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 yeah. Yeah. But he came up with great parts, and, wow. and Q would hire him to you know, do the arrangements of the songs that he wrote. So a lot of that stuff was great, but a lot of the other stuff, he'd just go, well, what do you got for me? Like, um... That song just once uh, with James Ingram was singing on the big hit off the dude record. That was just me coming up with the part. Yeah, on Human Nature, that was me coming up with my own part on that for Michael, the Steve Carl song. We, and the, well, this you probably told the story a billion times. The whole thriller thing, you know. I mean, it was like, I mean, <laughs> I mean, you well, got you. I mean, you did so much on that. And well, I didn't. You know, I did three or four things on that. The but big you did, ones, did, did, you know, the big record. Were you thinking like the, I mean? You could tell it was I was good. laughing, you know, the beat it thing was like, yeah. you know, when I heard the, you know, first off, the way we had to fix that track, somebody else, I've told the story. Yeah, a million times. 
Yeah. Small. The Reader's you know, Digest version is that there was another version that they had originally cut, and then it was sent to Eddie Van Halen to do a solo. Right. And somebody had, had, I thought it was uh, Don Landy, and Don got mad at me for saying that. Yeah. Sorry, Don. The, uh, somebody up at Ed's house cut the two inch tape, which screwed up the Simpty code, yeah. which locks the 224 right, right. track tape. Right. But it was the master with Michael's, you know, Michael would quintuple his vocals every five times. It would all be right. very meticulously comped and put together pain in the ass to do it again right yeah so that was on one thing with eddie's first generation solo and hitting and michael hitting two and four a drum case and this and a simpty code a new simpty code which we were set sunset sound with umberto critique and me and jeff picard was yeah. put this yeah. put humpty dumpty back together backwards yeah so we jeff went out and made a click track yeah. and listening to michael's bleed through of five times with the headphones and just blah, blah, like that. And he made his own click track and played a drum part. Mm -hmm. And then I overdubbed the guitars and, yeah. and then bass. And then we sent it to Quincy. And Quincy was like, no, nah, that's too too much rock. And I had the Marshalls cranked. Yeah. Because Eddie was on it. I said, like, yeah. So he goes, no, he used the Fender and turn it down that distortion. I don't want that much. He goes, it's got to get on R&B radio. He wanted to do the yeah, yeah. crossover. So anyway, added to me going down, and this is before I knew what the words were, the song, we just had the riff, you know, right. da, 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 that was Michael's <laughs> riff. Yeah. I helped him with the da, 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 da. that part was mine. But he, but he, but he came up, he had a lot of repetitive stuff that I tried to help him as a player go, well, what about this? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, of course, he was like, they, of course, he might go, yeah, that's great. We like that. Was Michael there? Yeah. Oh, very cool. But, but when I heard, your, you know, your butt is mine, you know, it take man i'm cracking up and we'll beat it yeah. i'm sitting in the room and like, <laughs> it's just like i can't beat it really he's gonna sing that i did the same thing when i played on let's get physical for olivia and john i started like you know humping the day you know i'm doing the overdub for john farrar i go let's get fit now steve Kipper wrote the song it's crazy. it was a multi-platinum single but yeah. you know i'm with my demented <laughs> yeah, childish you're thinking, mind. Like, are you serious my childish mind goes right there like, you know, yeah. goofy, you know what I mean? Like my scatological yeah. butthole sense of humor goes right there. <laughs> well, come on, beat it. And, and both of them, you know, Quincy's like, shake his it's not like that. And then John Farrar's going, it's going to be a big record, mate. He's an Australian guy. I go, yeah, but let's get, you know, really? Yeah. Turns out both hey, of those are multi-gazillion. Gazillion songs. Yeah. When I go, that's a smash. Dead in the water. Yeah. Nothing. I'm that guy too. Not the head of like, AR. Me Meatloaf when they did bad when they did I'll do anything for love, but I won't do that. I'm like, I'm laughing. No one's gonna play an eight and a half minute song. And then a year later I'm asked to do the intro, which is another two and a half minutes. I'm like, sure, pay me. Of course it was number one in twenty countries in one week. And I'm like, well. If you ever want any advice, do the opposite of what I say. Because I used to say that, hey, if I think it's a hit, just forget it. Yeah. If I'm mm -hmm. laughing and going, what are you kidding? Yeah. Number one. I know. So tell me about that. I mean, the whole total thing. Did you ever think it'd be still going on now? And you're the last guy standing, you right? hair. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Total hair. No, Did you think white you, you're, the, hair. you're the last guy standing, right? Well, me and Paige. Yeah. I mean, Paige is good. But he's not road. touring anymore. Well, it comes out once in a while, but oh, like, you can't do full tours. Yeah. Medically, it's just not there. Yeah. I mean, Doc said you can't do this. Anymore. I mean, dude. So he still he makes all of this. Me and him make all the decisions in the band right. with Joseph as well. Joseph Williams. But, but I mean, you probably but, never thought it'd be gone. Man, we thought if we got 10 years, wouldn't that be outrageous? Yeah. Like our heroes, the Beatles, been together for 10 years. It was 1977 when we got signed. So the Beatles, <laughs> you know. Yeah. It was only seven years after the Beatles broke up. Excuse me. Yeah. And so we figured 10 years, what, gosh, we didn't get it. We you know, were dreaming of a hit record in 10 years, and all of a sudden now it's, you know, 46 years. I really never guessed it. I mean, you know, we wouldn't still be doing it if, if nobody showed up or nobody. Well, I, but you said it's kicking ass even more now. There's been 15 incarnations. Of the world, yeah. And I've been 15? 15. And we're... Different bass player, you know, well, Mike John John, Pierce is you know, in John, well, John's in there now, who's my oldest friend in life. Yeah, I know. You know, that's so cool. So I'm surrounded by childhood friends still, even though we got some killer younger players now that are yeah. holding their, all their energy to it. But I saw some. I mean, it's not 1978 total, the original with Jeff and, you know, yeah, and yeah. how could it be? It's not, it's impossible. 
Yeah. I'm just trying to keep the music alive because it's, I put my whole life into this thing, mm. fought mm. for it. Yeah. When it wasn't cool, you know, when we took all this crap, you know, you guys did it. took so crap. much. You guys shit. got beat up and you, you'd won all those Grammys and you had all these hits and people gave you guys crap. I, I didn't get it. I don't know that they thought that being a studio, you they, can't they, be a like, yeah. we couldn't be a rock, real rock yeah. band if we were a studio player. Yeah. Like being a studio player is a bad thing. Yeah. Like, ooh, studio player. Yeah. That's not very punk. Meanwhile, you guys were the bad you know, assassin like, you did. Well, you know, stupid. I mean, when punk first hit, we were like in the studying five different kinds of teachers, learning about music, and all of a sudden it's totally uncool to be a great player. Yeah. Because it was the 70s got technique. I oh, heard, yeah. You know, and then the, the, the punk thing was just to bash that out, you know, yeah. which is cool. I get it, you know, but to compare us to that is not fair. And that's what they did. They were like, this is what everything that's wrong. And they point to us right. and this is everything that's right. And they put the sex pistols. You go, like, how can you compare that? I know. And you got, there was nobody like Toto. You guys, it's like chocolate covered garlic. They don't go together. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, that's, that exists in its own thing. You know, that was a phenomenon. Can't be an old punk, can you? But you can be an old musician. Yeah, I mean, you know, all I ever wanted was a long career. But you got it, man. You know, all the it's awards still, and, and all the going. accolades and all that stuff. I mean, you know, sure, that's wonderful. It's very nice, but just being around, still being able to go out and do it. You know? Yeah, I mean, no. you know, with the exception of the pandemic, which is the worst thing that ever happened to me in my life, for on so many levels. But crazy. But the point being that if that's retirement. I want no part of it. Yeah. Sitting around, oh, my house, sitting around my house for two years going, there's nothing to do but get into trouble. And I was so manically depressed and walking into walls. It was a bad trap. Well, you know, we figured out how uh, an incredible way to get through life, which was to play music, go on tour, and you keep sessions. You only with... retire from a job that sucks. Yeah. Live. If you're, if you're like the cat that fucking, you know, Married your first girlfriend, popped out the kids, do a job you kind of hate. You You're looking for retirement. Family. You're working for the, the day that you don't have to do that. Yeah, anymore. yeah. You know, man, us, we just yeah. retire and do what? I'm, no. What are Willie Nelson say? When are you going to retire? Willie goes, well, let's see. I play golf during the day and play music at night. When am I going to retire from? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm going to go with Willie on that one, you know? Glenn, Glenn Johns once asked, so I was doing the Stevie Nicks record. He goes, yeah, Kenny, at the end of the day, he says, uh, what's your five-year plan? Or what, 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 what haven't you done that you want to do? And I was like, uh, keep doing what I'm doing? I don't have a five-year plan. Why would I? I just want, and funny enough, that's what happened. I just kept doing what I'm doing. I mean, no, there's no five-year plan. I mean, I don't know what else I would do. At my age, a five-year plan is like, will I make it five years? <laughs> At this point, I'm getting spam crematorium. Oh, forest lawn. Stuff. Are you getting that? What is it? The R. <laughs> Have you found your final resting place? Yeah, yeah. No, the, the, yeah. What's how that? many good? How many good summers do I have left? You know what I mean. Maybe I should spend some money, money that I've been saving yeah. uh, and go somewhere with the kids and make memories because you know. Yeah, I love the play. I love to do this. I'll just keep doing it till I do it. But you know, do I want to be on the road for two hundred days a year like I've been doing? Probably not as much. But are you I'd are you at two hundred still? Oh yeah. That's a lot. Yeah, sometimes I get so a week off that. in between tours. You know? Well, because you're juggling three different bands. You got yeah. Ringo, you got Toto, yeah. and you got your career. And Toto's but, been working a lot. So. 200, now that, that, that'd be like serious. Yeah, but I mean, it's, for a 65-year-old guy, that's a lot. That's a, yeah, you know? hey, I just got off the road 10 weeks with Satriani in, in uh, Europe. and, uh, and 10 we get, weeks, yeah, that's, that's, you know, I did 12, that's. It changes you. It does. Three months, like, wow, man. This like, time it did. It you was, come home and everything looks different. There's a new gas station and nothing looks right. <laughs> Everybody looks different. I know? loved it, but it was like, man, we that was a lot of work, man. That was a lot of work. At 16 shows now, and 18 didn't he just days? change bands? Huh? Didn't Joe just change bands? Yeah. Are you still doing it? Yeah. Okay. As well, we're about to go out and do another five shows, opening up with Steve Miller. And the, the keyboard player and bass player can't do it, so we're getting two other guys that I've never played with. You know, I'm sure totally fine. I think they, the guy for the keyboard player from Dream Theater and oh, you mean Derek? Derek Sheranian. Yeah, he's great. I know he was amazing. He's a lovely guy. Yeah, and uh, I can't remember the bass player. I'm spacing out, but anyway, but no, I'm gonna go do. 
I'm doing it next year with Joe, you know, G3. And then Joe's one of my favorite cats. I mean, not only flawless, guy. flawless position. Humble. Yeah, and Humble. one of the funniest, greatest. He's been so <laughs> great. He's such a great friend to me. He is. I passed. And when we were on tour, I kept, every time you said, tell Joe, I say hi, I'd say, Steve says hi. hi. He's no, small. No, no, this I, guy. I love him and Rubina, man. They're, they're oh, man. Rubina's the coolest. She's the coolest. She is the coolest wife of an artist I've ever met in my life. She's on the road the whole time, totally cheerleader, funny as hell. Oh, yeah. So she's she's funny. He's good. Well, so is he, man. People don't realize how funny he is. He's goofy. Yeah. When we did the G3 thing together with Vibe, yeah. and, uh, Steve Vibe back in 1920. Yeah, I saw you guys, remember? You're right. We, did the, I, we saw each other in, in Australia. Byron Bay. Byron Bay Blues Festival. I've been up Australia. all night, and you said, get your ass over here. I'm like, I'm, but I haven't slept. Just get your yeah. ass over here. So I came over. See that was you fun. But we had like the, the the Billy Bob teeth, and we had these yes. other characters yeah. we turned into. Yeah. Behind, like nobody would ever see that. It was just us making each other laugh. That was a great combination. The three of you guys sound so oh, different. Oh man, I was definitely low man. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm was, glad I went on first. It's it was like, great, man. It's like the guy with the twenty inch cock. You don't want to be the. He goes last. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Joe, Joe. Uh, like, now, see, I'm going to get in trouble for saying that. No, I can bleep it out. I don't care, man. Joe, I know. I know. That's, that's what I love. So me. That's what I love. I made a joke. And Joe came up to me at one point, and he says, Kate, come over here, Kenny. Puts a guitar on me, his guitar. I'm like, yeah? And then he pushed me out on stage. You and he, put, he took his glasses and put his glasses on mine, and my he, face. Pushed me out on stage. The audience went, yeah. And then yeah. they realized I had muscles, you know, and they went, that can't be Joe, but that's Joe's humor. He thought that was funny. Yeah, yeah, it is funny. Yeah. I would have done it to you if I looked like that. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of cool because the both of us, you know, we're on that side of the stage and the guys were here on that side of the stage. It's cool. Playing the part of Joe Satriani tonight is Kenny Aronoff. Yeah. And the audience goes, oh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's what they did. Well, of course, I was stupid enough to hit the guitar, and they knew right away, that ain't Joe. No. Not. No. <laughs> oh, my <God>. Faux Joe. <laughs> yeah. F-A-U-X. Yeah. Faux Joe. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, I know you and Eddie were so good friends, and you and Jeff Beck were such great friends. And like, Well, we were back in the day, man. I, last time I saw Jeff was last July. Wow. When he, so I'm right at the, I hadn't seen him for a while before that. It was really great that I had that moment. Yeah. We had a chance to hang, give each other a hug, and have a laugh or two. He was out Johnny Depp, who's a really sweet guy. I know. He, came up and said, like, he was a really nice guy. He, he is a nice guy. I liked him very much. I'd never met him before. And, uh, you know, that was tragedy. It's sick. I, mean, I did a record so with him bizarre. that never came out, but, you know, never got to finish it. But, man, he, Jeff is one of the most special. Yeah. And then Ed, man, Ed and I were... I, mean, I know. Buds, I mean, we were, when we were naughty, we were naughty. But even when, when we cleaned our act up, we were still buds. You know, yeah. I mean, we still could relate to each other. Yeah. It's like That's all it. the crazy guitar players that used to drink too much and party too much. It's like we all stopped at the same time without ever having a conversation. No shit. Everybody. Wow. I'm not going to start naming names. I don't want to, but they're all the obvious players, you know, crazy guitar players of the early 90s. Wow. Late eighties, early nineties, whenever it was raging. And then yeah, at yeah. one point, right before everybody would have bet we're all gonna drop dead. Everybody had like a an awakening. Yeah. A personal awakening without ever and just stop. That's wild, man. That's, and now everybody's still cool. And Ed was one of them part of that. Yeah. So we supported each other through that. You told me up at your house that he used to come up. One of his hot rods buzzing around. Oh, he took the front end. No, he took the front end of his Countach off of my of my <laughs> old driveway, man. Just the whole thing folded up just because they're so low to the ground. Because I'm going, no, the... <laughs> that would have been like in the eighties, yeah, like the early eighties. Did he just leave it there? No, he just ripped it off and threw it in the back. Said, "Nah, fuck it." It's like sad. I got a crazy story. I that... loved him dearly. I miss him. Ah, I bet. That's, that, that's why. I, one of a kind musician. And, yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. It's really great about Wolf, though, man. It's not as playing great. Badass. Great stuff. And, yeah. God bless him. You remember, uh, this is a, a, I thought about this just the other night. I was saying, God, dude, we have so many wild stories. We could just like, be talking about stories. So I'm playing at the forum with Mellencamp, sold out, maybe two nights. And you came. I invite you to come, and I meet you up at the forum bar at the end, 
of the night. And we come looking at each other. This is when we were all drinking. And we do a shot of tequila. And I remember I stuck my tongue out. And you stuck your tongue out. Everyone's watching. We're going, ah. And we touch tongues in front of everybody. I don't have any problem with that. I don't either. I'm secure with my sexuality. Well, I mean, I'm not gay. But, but to know, keep the story, but that just gives you, you know, that's just getting started. No, it's started. like, you know what it is? It's like, okay, how far will you go? Exactly. And we were drunk enough to like, we're like, okay, well, everybody, I'm going to get this close and somebody just yeah. goes, ah. Yeah, exactly. It just and and uh, yeah. the bar, they thought, there's no way. And there was way. So <laughs> then we get into that's your That's the fun of it. It's taking us. Mm. Well, how far can we go? I'm game. All the way. Yeah. That's how far we can go. So we get in your limo or something. There's two guys in there with us. And I'm, for some reason, I'm sitting at the Bel Air. You know, so we go up the Bel Air. I remember that. Remember that? So we, Didn't you, like, tear off your clothes yes. and jump in the pool at the I public? Did. You know, Completely naked. So I, it was kind of boring and stiff there. We're sitting there, nothing going on. So I rip off. I take off my shirt. I'm going, I'm getting hot, man. But then I start taking my pants off. But nobody can see because it's dark. Right. Anyway, I go, I jump up, dive in the pool naked, and then the security I remember. Came. Years later, Miguel Farrar. Miguel, my brother, God yeah. bless. Yeah. Hey. He's passed. He goes, hey, man. You remember that night you did your clothes off? I went, what are you talking about? He tells me, and I didn't even know, George Clooney and him were in that limo with us, and mm -hmm. they were just kind of aspiring actors just trying to make George was just cousin George back then. Yeah. Before he and so up. Yeah, I've known George way before. It's just a crazy he was Miguel's cousin. Yeah. I know. And you know, I still I'm, I'm I love George. I mean we still we still hang every once in a great while. And he's busy living, you know, working. Oh, yeah. We're all busy doing oh, but every once in a while we get to hang, you know, and it's it's great. And, and Miguel was my best buddy, man. And that was sad. He, he got cancer, died. Right? Yeah, throat cancer. He was, nasty, really painful. It was hard to watch him go like that. It really hurt me to see him like that. Yeah, he was a cool dude. Oh, he was. He was, he was crazy. gonna do like a Buddy Rich movie, and he was. He was trying to get that done. Yeah, yeah. He was. He wanted to play Buddy. Yeah, he'd be perfect. He would have. He had the perfect voice and yeah. attitude. He. he but would, uh, and he could play drums. That's the other. thing. Could he? Oh, Mickey was a drummer. Not like Buddy though. Well, like nobody, nobody could yeah, play yeah. like Buddy, but I mean, he yeah. could have. As an actor, at least faked yeah. it good enough to know, like, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, it yeah. wasn't like somebody who doesn't want to play. And then do the close ups, you get some yeah. bad. In. Yeah. Anyway, that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that was, that's a, just such a great memory, you know? I mean, yeah. LA. There's so many memories, man. Yeah. And there's the little ones I forgot. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, but yeah, you know, you're you know when people come at you, like, you know, uh, you're at an event and you remember the time, blah, blah, blah. You're, you're like, you're like, you're like mm, or, I don't know if I want to know. Yeah. I always think like somebody was going to show up and say, hey, you got to pay for uh, your kid's college education. But nobody ever showed up yet. So I got low. Oh, well, yeah, really? No. Well, I no don't, by yet? now, I would have they would I would have known. I'm sure that somebody wanted to collect on that. Well, now that they can, that you know, you've admitted that you've done this, I'm going to pop up. <laughs> yeah, but it, they're, 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 those kids are 40 years old, so they're done with the college. There's a lot of bald for you, old guy. <laughs> yeah, with big noses. <laughs> so how did you slip into the autobiography? Because I got talked into mine. Oh, well, man, I, I didn't. You know, I'll tell you what happened. And, and I wasn't planning on doing you it. You weren't doing it. I'm not right? a writer. I don't. Yeah. I mean, one and done. I'm never going to do it again. Yep. It was three years of my life. Yeah. So what before. I did was I was invited to do a kind of a Q&A at the Grammy Museum. Yeah. And I went on stage. It was a packed house. And there were... 300 people shoved into a room. And I started telling my stories, and they were very funny and doing impressions of the people I was working with. Yeah. And my agent at the time said, you have to write a book. I had people in the aisles cracking up, telling these outrageous Of course you did. With all these super famous, yeah. legendary people that I made records with and things, funny things to that. So that's how that happened. I got offered a deal right on the spot. Oh, right there? Yeah, well, pretty much. Yeah. You wouldn't do another one? What about the stories you didn't put in the book? Oh, that's for the reason for that. Yeah, exactly. You know, some that's... things should be left buried deep into the ground. Yeah. People say, man, I loved your book. Is it uh, you probably would like the stories that weren't in the, the book. The 400 pages that hit the ground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I just, you know, I didn't want to make 
do one of these ridiculous tell-alls where you oh, no. name names and hurt or talking negative about anything. I didn't want to be that. The challenge with me was you have to tell the truth. You can't just like sugarcoat everything. Otherwise, they won't believe anything you're writing. So. No, but you know, there, there are certain things that I yeah. edit out. Yeah. Didn't need to be public. Yeah. The public to know everything. I mean, come on. No, oh, well, you know. Some things have to, you have to die. Yeah, yeah. When you die, it dies with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The sacred yeah. hosts and all that. No one could ever find out about this. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I've got a bunch of those. That's yeah. Scary. So you know, last time I don't know if you remember. This is this is where you did that interview with uh, Sammy. Oh yeah, and we did that cool the jam thing. The jam thing, you know, and and the thing that was a lot trust. of people don't realize. I just want to say it on here is like so. Sammy's got this show on, you know, Access TV, right. and he wanted, um, he said, calls me and goes, man, I need a guitar player, man. I said, well, Steve's got his locker right down there, right next to me. So I call up Steve. So I call you up and says, oh, man, it was during the pandemic or something. And you go, oh, what are we doing? I says, it, was it uh, Crossroads? It was it the yeah. yeah. So we said, oh, I could do that. So we're going to do it. But then all of a sudden, the guy who was supposed to be interviewed was a bass player. He bailed out because he didn't want to, because of the pandemic, he was a little paranoid. So then you said, well, Trev can play bass. Well, that's a great bass player. That was unbelievable. But what people don't, may not realize, no rehearsal. Sammy doesn't use monitors. He just listens to the guitar. What you see, and it's pretty hot, man, because it's been on on um, YouTube. Well, I can't watch the shit, man. I want to roll. I don't well, it's great, I'm man. On the end, no. Energy. And Trev, man, is tearing it up, man. He's smiling the whole time. He look, He's got great time. He looks He looks great on camera. He's a star, Dude, man. He is, man. He's got the smile. He's smiling. got a project now. What is he saying? He's working with Phil Collins. He's what? Phil Collins' son, Nick, and him, and, he, and oh. some singer guy are working on a project right now. Maybe wow. I shouldn't be talking about school, wow. but I heard some of the music. Like, wow. So I was bad. I mean, he just hasn't want... found, I mean, he's been producing records with people and writing songs. He's had success. Really has. And, um, but he hasn't found the thing that put him to the forefront. So I'm hoping this would be, yeah. he's a great songwriter. I mean, he produced a track on my new record, wrote and produced a track. Really? Produced, my son produced it. Dad, do that again. That's lame, man. One more time. I can see with that grin, too. Oh, no, I know. No, he was great. But he knows. I, I he knows. He oh, I trust. I said, come on, let's do this. Dude, that's so awesome, I mean, man. At the time, he was 35 years old. He just turned 36. But... 36. I remember when he was barely playing. No, I mean, I had him. I was dragging him into the studio to play, even just yeah. power chords on record. Yeah. That's like when he was 13. I took him on the road with me, and that's what changed. Oh, when he yeah. saw it, I dragged him on stage. He played in front of 10,000 people with he got that rush, and then you know, then he. I said, "Well, now you got to dig in and really practice." Yeah, you really do this, you know? and he does, and he did. Yeah. Well, dude, I mean, so I'm like, well, what is? I mean, you're doing what you're doing, two hundred shows a year. I'm happy, what, man. What, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm really happy. Just keep to be, doing the same shit, right? You're not gonna. Listen, I'm, you know, we make. I mean, I got a solo record called Bridges coming out next at the end of the week, yeah. I think. <clears throat> Which is just a fun look back into what we used to do. Pay David Page, Joseph Williams, and I wrote most of the stuff. With no Sam kidding. Lynch wrote word lyrics with us, and Randy Goodrum, and Simon came back and played on some stuff. Oh, some no books, kidding. and then some of the old Toto guys to have that vibe. Yeah, you know, make a shameless '80s record. Yeah, yeah. Said, well, nobody else does it. Why? Well, to scratch the creative itch, because you know that means I can go on the road and play hits for everybody and do all that yeah. stuff. I don't think to make some new music every once in a while. I'm yeah. Like, I'm not going to have a number one record in the world and sell 10 billion copies. Yeah. But it'll do well enough. It Dude, well, you got a big fan base. And not, you know, nine records and then total. You, you got know, a fan people base. buy the stuff for me. I'm not, it's not like it used to be back in the day when records would really sell and you could see back like, then. They sold 40 million up there. Yeah, well, I mean, you, you know, when does that happen? Me and Lil, well, 40 million. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Have it again. You're lucky. I'm in a 40. gold record, though. So. Yeah, a unicorn now. You and I know gold yeah, records. Are gold, right? Your That's five hundred thousand. You used to apologize for gold. I know. Oh, really? oh, my no. gold, man. Sorry. Yeah, but now you take that heartbeat. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, who would have thought that the record business was like was the horse and buggy business being replaced by the car? We don't need those anymore. Well, when the AI is going to get really good, and they're not going to need anybody, and they want to pay anybody. So, so. yeah. 
Well, all the record labels made out somehow, they always do. They own the masters. When you own the masters. Yeah, the masters. You own the masters of all those recordings. He's selling to Spotify. Well, and there, there, was a, there was a little, though, for a moment there, there was a little window where we were told we're signed in 1977, which we were. The 35 year rule meant that you could get your oh, first. You get it back. You get it back. Well, that's what. We tried to do that. We hired a lawyer to do that. And no. They say they laughed. They said, no. What? They go, we're never going to give that to anybody, man. But I don't, because I, what keeps these guys in business is not one hit wonders. It's the catalog artists that they don't really give much love to, but they get people like us that keep making them a lot of money. We yeah. got three point, almost 3.5 billion streams in the last eight years. And because they wouldn't give me that deal, I talked them into giving me a really great percentage on the streaming so i like streaming yeah we made a good deal before they knew that spotify was going to be the only game in town yeah the only game in town. so this was a long time ago when i first said as well so you made hey, a good deal hey, was going make sure when i was negotiating was make sure you get streaming i go okay i'll, I'll i'm gonna push for that they'll probably give me that as a trade-off that's what it is we're never giving you your record back we'll give you a better royalty rate overseas because i know that you so much they gave us a little bit we spent a fortune on lawyers that wow. just took money from us and didn't do shit. And then, but I negoti negotiated the deal to get a really good percentage that you can't get any more from that. So, but well, thank good you God. very much for uh, good. And that's in in perpetuity. So you got to keep paying us. Yeah, and you know we've done very well. You know, it's just you know, I can't complain. Then Weezer brought you know. Well, yeah, they were making. They, well, they did, did they, it as it a was joke. Africa, they right? did it as a joke. You know, like uh huh. Uh -huh. And so it backfired on back it, and, right and they had a big hit with it. Right into your lap. Right. I love it. Yeah, that, that, that was, you know, very strange. The whole phenomenon of that. Well, From the really cool versions to the yeah. really stupid ones. Yeah. You know, I, mean, I mean, I laugh at this stuff, but it's not to laugh at. Yeah. But, you know, I'll take the golden carrot. Yep. Got a whole young audience again. Yeah. You know, a lot of young kids yeah. realize, hey, these guys got 17 albums out. I remember when you... We were talking about it. You were like, check this one out. And you told me. It gave us a whole new lease, man. Yeah. And, you know, it's one of the songs. It's just, and that's the song when we cut that. I was like, this will never be a hit. Are you kidding me, man? Well, it was so different. There's nothing like it. Well, the track was great, but I, it, the lyrics. You know, no. It's like, come on. Man. No. Really? Yeah. You know, I mean, and we laughed and yeah. we did it anyway, you know, but never thinking that wasn't going to be the one that was. Yeah. That, that doesn't even, that doesn't even define what our band really sounds like. It was not an oddball, at all weird track not that we all. did for fun yeah. production exercise using loops and million yeah. dollar four twenty four track tapes, really? tape machines in sync four. Okay, it that's doesn't sound like a lot of stuff. Well, there was on. lab coats. It was really hard to get the you know this is in like we recorded in nineteen eighty one, mm -hmm. mixed in eighty two. It came out the end of eighty two. It was in eighty three. Why would you have to have four tapes? I mean, because that... we just couldn't stop overdubbing. Oh. But if you open up some more tracks, it was a big Somebody joke was, uh, there it was, was a some big... late night activity. Oh, that, there was a lot of, that, you know. In that session, now I got an idea. It was 1981. <laughs> yeah, I know. We were recording the record. Does that have to say any more than that? Yeah, 81. Yeah, 81, yeah. That was the height of the yeah. L.A. madness. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Nobody would go home. Yeah. He yeah. just stayed there. He just stayed there. <laughs> yeah. And you realize you had a session in the, ne in the next room the next morning. Yeah. You're young. You could do stupid shit like that. Nobody knew. We were, it was all innocent fun at the time. It was just fun. We, before it got dark, weird, and fucked up, yeah. which it did. But yep. those of us that live to tell, live to tell. The Halloween party at Teddy Landau's house or Michael's house. Yeah. That was a family. It was all the cats. We were, we were all dressed up like Elvis. Yeah. And there was... I remember at five in the morning. Maybe we should think about going home. I think I went to sleep candy, in my car candy, candy. and never really slept. But you know, yeah. that was no, that was a famous know, party. You just ate the steering wheel because you didn't show up. <laughs> well, on that note, uh, on that note, that was, that was, yeah, yeah, right? You know, uh, you know, we are actually serious musicians, but we did some stuff that wasn't so serious. You know, <laughs> well, you had that fun somewhere yeah. on top of the fun. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It was, yeah, we were having fun and then having fun. Yeah, exactly. Took the work very seriously, but the, yeah, 
The After Hours Club was the oh, After man. Hours Club. Well, it was a beehive. We met on Sunset. There were clubs everywhere. Everyone was everywhere. Well, all the studios, man. Right? I mean, yeah, we were always studios, yeah. well, we were, every day. You'd be like running into everybody. That's was, what I love. It was a club. Uh, yeah. Incredible. It was a great club. The greatest club ever. Yeah. Now I come up and have coffee at your house every That's so true. often. Yeah, right. That's the club. Club, club, hey, man, coffee. You know. I've accepted my old manness. Yeah. That's why I stopped dying my hair. That's great, man. But, you know, I'm like, hey, man, I'm an old guy. I'm starting to tell, man. That's great. I used to be insane. Yep. I did all that. I'm sorry for some of the shit got a little too weird, but, you know. (laughs) Yeah. It is what it is, you know, and and I wouldn't. No, you can't regret nothing. No, I mean, there's a few things I would have, like, maybe I shouldn't have done that, but, you know, most of the time it's just like, we were just. Yeah. Making music, partying, living the life that we always dreamt about. Yeah. And now we got older and, and we, we can can talk la- about and it. We can laugh about it. Yeah. So, it, there's some, so many incredible stories that yeah. didn't take forever. We'll have to go with part 25 next time. Well, I'm glad, uh, man, I'm, I'm glad that we got to experience the music stuff, still doing it together, and, yeah. and the hang now. It's so cool. I mean, how many people can you share this with? Not that many. No, no, there's, there's, there's nobody came up behind us, really. Now everybody shares files. And it's, yeah, it's, it's a whole different same thing. Hang. whole different thing. Because we were hanging. You couldn't do it. You, you had to do it. You had to be in a room with musicians. You had to be at No team. rehearsals, no demos. No, you just hand. show up. Dude, never send me demos. You show up, you learn the song right there, go out and play. Bam. And you got to do, uh, by the way, we got to do five songs today. You know, you just did it. It was great. We'll do it, man. Thanks, Thank you, dude. All right. Bye out there.